Good evening. Thank you for joining us for our September 2021 Fundamentals Meeting of the Naperville Astronomical Association. Uh, I'm Jim Irwin. I'm the current club president. And uh, if you're watching us live tonight on either Facebook or our website, we have two different ways that you can ask questions to our speaker. If you're on Facebook, you can either post them in the, the comments section and we will feed those uh, to our speaker. Or if you're watching on our website, you can email questions at naperastro.org and we will get those to uh, Eric as well. Tonight, our speaker is Eric Clays. Uh, Eric, uh, Eric's parents gave him a $69 Kmart focal telescope when he was in sixth grade. The only things he could see were some planets, the sun, the moon, and the inside of his neighbor's house. However, the scope was enough to spark an interest which carried through his teenage years. Astronomy was his first Boy Scout merit badge, in fact, and into his college years where he would occasionally use it during breaks. After getting a job, he continued using the telescope several times a year for many years. Eric joined the NAA in 2010 and his interest in astronomy increased greatly. After talking with other people about their scopes, he bought a real telescope, a Celestron C11. He quickly found out he could take pictures using his telescope, so he started doing it with his DLSR. One thing led to another and Eric eventually bought a lot of, a, a, bought a lot in an astronomy community in the mountains of New Mexico and had a, an observatory built, which he has been operating remotely for almost a year. Tonight, Eric will share with you some things he learned about building and operating a remote observatory. Many of his tips will also apply to local observatories. Uh, Eric, thank you very much. I'm gonna turn everything over to you. Okay, thank you, Jim. I uh, still have that telescope my parents gave me, although to be honest, I haven't used it in 10 years or so, but it's, it's sitting in the basement, but uh, it brings back good memories. So tonight I'll be talking about uh, some of my learnings from having an observatory built. I didn't physically build it since uh, I was working and it would have been pretty impractical for me to, to try to go down there um, while you're working because it needed quite a bit of time. So. Um, things I'll talk about, um, categories and types of observatories, uh, initial decisions that need to be made, um, some things to think about when you're planning and building, um, what to do or think about to do when you're visiting your observatory, and using the observatory remotely, so how you do that and whatnot. So I think questions are good. Uh, feel free to ask them anytime. So your mileage may vary. So I'm giving you my experience um, in having an observatory built and using it. Uh, it may vary a lot based on the person and their particular uh, conditions. So the definitions uh, of the categories and types of observatories in the next couple of pages, again, are my definitions. Um, you may find something different elsewhere. So categories, so I kind of, really wanted to view this as two, local and remote, but I kept finding that there's something in between local and remote, and that's intermediate. So what I consider a local observatory is one that's within an hour or so. It's often in your backyard, so it's definitely something that you can use, you know, go to in an evening and come back that same evening. Um, often the opening and closing of the roof is done manually. In fact, it may not even have any electricity other than for the mount. Um, usually in the observer, you are usually in the observatory to start an astrophotography session. Um, and there's little of any redundancy. A remote observatory, I consider one to be far enough away that it takes planning to actually visit it. In my case in New Mexico, it's 22 hour drive. So I can't just on a whim go there. Um, Typically remote observatories are used for astrophotography and that's because they're so far away, you're not likely to have one built and you know, use it uh, just to go do visual, although you could. And often there's lots of redundancy in a remote, uh, remote observatory. So something in between those two, what I call intermediate. So the distance is between local and remote, but you can still easily get there, um, possibly for a weekend. It 
probably is not something you want to do, you know, after work. If it takes you two hours to get there and two hours to get back, but you know, you could, but typically more of a weekend. Um, it's similar in many respects to a remote observatory in that if it's, you know, far, somewhat far away, if you want to use it when you're not there, then you have to have internet connectivity and all that fun stuff. And it typically has some redundancy, although it also could have a lot of redundancy. But usually if it's close and something breaks, um, you can go fix it versus a remote one. If something breaks, you might not be able to fix it for months until you get out there. Um, the various types of observatories, uh, dome, this is I think what most people think of when they hear the word observatory. Um, it's limited to one telescope since you have a, an aperture or a slit that's usually only wide enough for one telescope. Um, they're a very good choice in windy locations uh, as long as you're not pointing into the wind. Um, so you can use them typically on, on most clear nights. Um, but because it has a thin slit, uh, the view of the sky is very limited. In fact, you probably would not want to be inside trying to look outside. You would instead go outside. And if you're doing astrophotography, which I'm kind of assuming you will be doing since this talk is primarily about remote observatories, you would need to synchronize the, uh, the rule for the dome with, the, with your mount so that as your mount turns, the dome also turns. And our GDRO has a dome roof on a larger building, as you can tell by this picture. Um, and that provides a fair amount of storage space, which is also very important for a remote observatory where you may or may not have a house. Um, and you can also have a dome uh, be the same width of the building. Um, in fact, a lot of domes, that's how they are. The ones that you buy typically are like that. And those usually provide fairly limited storage space. Uh, although you can't put extensions on them, the extensions tend not to be very big. Um, another type of observatory, a clamshell, that's basically it's a type of dome, but with much better visibility to the sky. Um, they're also limited to one telescope, although in theory you could put a couple in there, but they're usually not real big. And once you start getting really big, they get very expensive. Um, they can be a decent choice in windy locations. The reason I say decent is that some of them only open halfway. In that case, if you have the, the dome um, back towards the wind, you can probably still um, take pictures. Um, they can be hard to get in and out of, like the one you see here. The, the guy's got the, uh, some stool or some steps that he's got, but even there, uh, it can be a little bit difficult, especially as you age, trying to get in those. They, they offer limited storage space. In fact, my guess would be other than a little bit of space on the inside of this dome, there's no additional space because you can't really have um, extensions that stick out because the roof of the dome would hit them. And depending on whether or not you have the, uh, the dome fully open or partially open, or whatever, you may or may not need to synchronize it with the mount. And then a third type of observatory is what I call the roll-off roof. Um, this can be used with multiple telescopes. And this is actually a picture of mine. And you can see my Celestron C11, the one I got 10 years ago. And then I have a second telescope um, in there. So you can, and they make roll-off roofs that are huge, you know, 30 by 40 feet or something. And you can have lots of telescopes in, those, in there. They have great views of the skies. When I'm standing inside mine, I've got almost a perfect view of the sky. Um, they're not as good in windy locations uh, because the wind, you know, kind of just blows around the sides and, and gets in there. So in my case, there are some nights, a couple nights ago, it got so windy that the, uh, the roof closed on its own. And so I wasn't able to take pictures the rest of the night. But that's only happened to me a few times. Um, they can offer lots of storage space depending on how big it is. So if you make a really large one, um, you can store a lot of stuff in there. In my case, Mine is 14 by 16, I think it is. And so I have enough space inside to store, you know, all my empty boxes and all my stuff that's in there that I need when I, I visit there. And in this case, uh, with the roll-off roof, you don't need to synchronize it with the mount. Um, although obviously you do need to be able to open it before you start imaging and then close it when you're done. But in terms of uh, knowing where the mount is pointing, you don't really care. 
Um, so initial decisions to make before you actually do anything. So a big one is the budget, because um, that's really going to impact all of your other decisions. You know, are you going to go really inexpensive, or are you going to go hog wild, or you know, somewhere in between? Um, and obviously, that's only for you to determine. You can spend as much money as you want on an observatory. So who who will build it? Will you physically build it? You know, maybe with some friends, or are you going to find somebody to build it for you? Or are you going to actually buy a pre-made one? Although even the pre-made ones, like a dome, uh, typically you have to put it together, but you don't actually need to fabricate any parts. And if you're going to have somebody build it for you, how are you going to find somebody? Um, in my case, uh, as Jim mentioned, I live with, or my observatory, excuse me, is in a astronomy community. So there's 30 or so lots. Um, the gentleman that actually sells the lots lives there. He's just a couple of uh, lots away from mine. He's built oh, half a dozen at least observatories. So I felt pretty safe getting him to build it. Um, he also knows that most of the observatories in that area are used remotely, in which case you want them to work. If they break, like I said earlier, you may have to wait a couple of months before you can get it fixed. So what? Um, what type? of observatory, you know, the dome, the clamshell, the roll off. Um, I knew from the start that I wanted to have two scopes. So that really pointed towards a roll off, although I could have built two domes. But I kind of figured if I had two domes, that was two of everything, which means potentially twice as many problems. Although, to be honest, at this point, I this is something I, I wish I had spent more time thinking about, um, because with the wind, you know, as I said earlier, domes are better for the wind. But if I were to do it over, I would probably do the, uh, the same roll off route that I got. Um, the how, um, how often will you use it? And this could impact your decision whether or not you build, you know, a house or some other kind of shelter. If you're only going to be there once a year, it's probably a lot cheaper just to you know, rent a hotel or rent a cottage or, you know, stay somewhere versus building something. Um, no, I guess I skipped where. Uh, where are you going to put it? Obviously, you have to have some land somewhere or, or lease the land. Um, if you have land of your own, how much land? Do you want just enough for the observatory or do you want, you know, a lot of room around you or what? Are you going to put it in a field or on a mountain? Uh, is it going to be in a flood zone, in which case you need to be careful? Uh, is it going to be in a place that's prone to fires like, like mine? I'm actually in a national forest, although luckily for me, there's no real trees that are real close, um, but it's still, it's a fire hazard. And that's something uh, I need, be, need to be aware of. And then redundancy. So redundancy is a big one, and you'll hear this several times throughout the talk. Um, it really comes down to how comfortable you are with problems um, and how long it will take you to resolve a problem. So, you know, if your power goes out um, and you don't have backup power, you're out of it. If your PC doesn't reboot because the power went out and you can't get there for a month, then you can't, can't do anything for a month. Um, the more redundancy you have, though, typically the fewer outages or fewer problems you'll have, but uh, it's going to be a lot more complex and costly. And sometimes it can be significantly more complex and costly, depending on, um, on how much redundancy you have. So planning and building. Here are some things to consider as you're planning, designing the observatory, and as you're having it built. So insurance. Do you have insurance or not? Um, in my case, I do. Uh, and I'm paying, most of the insurance I'm paying for is actually for the fire hazard. They, uh, before I got the insurance, they wanted pictures. They had somebody come out and determine how far away the trees were, what kind of material the building was made out of. In my case, it's made out of uh, steel. So it's not going to burn or not likely to burn. Um, whether or not you have insurance, though, you want to take pictures of everything. And by everything, I mean everything. Take pictures of the buildings, the inside, the outside. If you have storage bins, take pictures of those, all the things in the storage bins. You know, I even went around and took pictures of all my outlets, um, you know, everything I could think of. 
Um, a couple of reasons to do this. One is the insurance suggested it, but I, I think it's a good idea nonetheless. So it's an easier way to prove what you have. Um, in my case also, I thought, well, if you know, my place burns down or I don't know, a tornado comes and blows it all away or something, I wanna know what I need to purchase to replace place it with. And so I actually kept track of my serial numbers, the models, the prices, and you can see from the spreadsheet, although you probably can't read it, it's, you know, I list the observatory and um, the telescope and it's a Mead telescope and the mount is a whatever mount and, and stuff. And then I actually have a column for the picture, the name of the picture that shows that item. So if I were to have to start over, I could go to this and I actually keep it pretty well up to date. Um, I've actually modified it a few times. So something else to consider is security. So if your observatory is gonna be out in the middle of nowhere, like to a large extent mine is, um, you wanna make sure you have a good lock and, and a deadbolt. As you can see in the picture here, this is a fairly common, it's a schlagy, schlage, whatever it's called. Um, in my case, I've got the ones where you can type in the number or a key. It's very, very helpful. Um, cameras are very useful for security, especially if you have human motion detection. Um, and this is one of my, or my camera that's outside, which does have motion detection. It also has infrared um, lights that I have turned on automatically at dusk. And my suggestion to be have it take pictures, you know, once a minute or whatever, or when it detects motion and upload those pictures offsite. So if you have a server or something offsite, the reason for that is if somebody comes in and steals your camera and then steals everything else, you know, you got ideally would have a picture of their face as you're taking the camera down. And then also when you upload them offsite, um, you can view them from home very easily, or you can have other people view them from home. Uh, network security, put your network behind a firewall. The last thing you want is to come in and find out that somebody broke into your network and, you know, had your your telescopes run into the wall or, you know, something. So put it behind a firewall. And just remember, you can't have perfect security. So one thing to consider, when you open the roof at night, somebody could jump in. So, you know, still, you want to have as much security as you can, but just realize that you can't have perfect security. So personal safety, and this obviously applies when you're there or anybody else is there. You, you don't want to have any sharp edges or things to harm you. This uh, blue foam that I put on the end of my counterweight bar, I don't know how many times it saved my head. It still hurts when I hit it, but not nearly as much as hitting a stainless steel solid uh, piece of, of metal. Um, find a spot for everything and, and keep the things there so you don't bump into it in the dark. Um, you know, ideally your observatory will be very dark if you're there. So you wanna know where things are. You don't wanna be tripping over any wires or anything like that. Uh, for your safety, you want a source of drink, drinkable water. And that might just be like what I typically do right now since I don't have a house on site is I just bring a whole bunch of gallons of water that I either get at home or at the, uh, the cabin I stay at. I just fill them up, fill them up and bring them in. Um, the fire extinguisher, Although if you're not there, this obviously isn't going to do any good. But if you are there and there's a problem, um, in my case, in New Mexico, code requires that there be a fire extinguisher, even in my observatory, which was uh, unknown before I started. And then you want uh, ground fault interrupt protection for everything. Um, and that's these outlets. In this case, you can see the little green light, meaning that the, the GFI is on. And consider when the roof is open, everything is basically outside. So you also want to have covers like I have here. Uh, and I've got the cover closed. So if it rains, nothing will get wet. Some of the uh, considerations for your building and your equipment. Um, you want to isolate the pier to minimize, minimize vibration. So there's a couple of ways you can do that. One is you can do it near the pier. So you might have uh, the pier bolted into concrete and then you know, a foot out from the pier, you have a gap in between that concrete and, and the concrete on the floor of the rest of the pier. So that's, that's clearly one way. Um, and, and that's a way that a lot of people do it, especially if they have wooden um, floors. In my case, I've got concrete. Another way is to isolate the pier by 
um, basically bolting the pier down to the main floor and then in between the main floor and the floor that holds the, the unit itself, the observatory itself, have something. So in my case, you can see um, this is the thing for the roof. Um, the, the light brown here is the actual wall of the observatory. So this is about a foot. And then right here is the floor of the observatory where I walk. And this is the close up. There's actually styrofoam here, about an inch. And then there's a piece of plywood. And so if it's windy outside and the observatory is shaking, that'll, that'll shake this concrete, but the styrofoam will absorb that shake and the floor of the observatory itself won't be shaking. Now you might say in this case, well, you know, this isn't good, Eric, because when you're walking around, you're gonna vibrate things. Well, if you remember a, ro a remote observatory, you're rarely gonna be there. So there's going to be nobody walking around. And in my case, when I am there, I'm just I'm just careful when I'm walking around. But also, my floor, my observatory is 18 inches deep. It weighs I don't know 20,000 pounds, something like that. So me walking around fairly gently is probably very unlikely to to vibrate the mount enough to make any difference. Connectors for your cables. Um, you don't want them to come loose. So there's various types you can use depending on how often you're going to plug them in and unplug them. So this is one type that you screw in. So this is good for ones where you're not going to unplug it very often because you need a screwdriver, which, you know, I have a small toolbox, not a problem. But um, you want to lock down everything you can, even a USB cable. If you can get a USB cable that locks, um, that's better than one that doesn't. Unfortunately, there are not many of them. Um, thing to consider is lightning. Um, in my case, at the top of a mountain, I'm 7,200 feet up, um, the chance of a lightning strike is, is relatively high. There have been, in fact, my neighbor three, three down did get hit by lightning. Um, ways to help mitigate this is to actually ground the observatory. So the walls are grounded, the pier is grounded, um, I actually have my concrete grounded. There's cables in the concrete that go into the ground. And then if you use uh, shielded cables for everything inside, that can, can also help. Um, something I didn't put here is uh, surge pr protection also can help a lot for this, for lightning. Um, fire, if you are in a fire hazard area, which, which I am, um, regularly remove the dead trees and branches, which I've done a couple of times now, partially because it just looks bad, but also, uh, you know, I don't want to have anything dead relatively close to my observatory. Uh, keep your trees and bushes as far away. The observatory is practical. What a lot of people do, especially if they have a house, is they will put gravel about 30 feet out from the observatory to kind of provide a fire break. And then there's a company barricade that has a gel. It's useful to spray on your observatory prior to a fire. It helps protect it. But obviously uh, this only helps if you or someone else is there to actually spray it. So equipment safety. Um, slewing is when the telescope moves from object to object. Tracking is it's when it's following your object. So it's going very slow. You really want to have either hardware limits or software limits on those two so that the chance of your, your uh, mount or your telescope running into the pier is, is minimal. You know, if something goes wrong and the software freaks out, you don't want it to be able to send your telescope into the pier. Or your even worse, typically, is your camera because the front of the telescope usually um, can survive a pier crash or camera. You could then cables, which I did once, or you can actually ruin your camera. You want the ability to home your mount if it gets lost. And by home, meaning if the mount has no idea where it's pointing, you want to be able to ideally push one button and have it go back to a known place. Um, ideally, uh, you want to have the roof be able to close when the telescope is in any position. And in my case, that's true because uh, my roof is high enough that it can close even if the telescope is pointing straight up. Um, but a lot of people don't have that case in which, uh, or don't have that kind of observatory, in which case they need to park the mount or move the mount to a more level position before they actually close the roof. 
but that just adds another variable that uh, you know, can break down. Uh, cable management is very important. When your, your telescope is moving, you don't want cables to catch on anything. So if you can, might be able to see here, I've got tie wraps. So the cables coming out of the mount here are tie wrapped to the bottom of this plate. So they're not going anywhere. I've got them tie wrapped here and then they go into the uh, focus or rotator here. So as this turns, it's, there's no way for any of these cables to hit anything. And then further on the uh, camera, I've got stuff wrapped on with Velcro. So these cables are not going anywhere. So I don't worry at all about uh, my equipment snagging on the cable, but that is a very real concern for a lot of people. So that's something you don't want to have happen when you're remote and you can't get there for a month to fix it. Um, a lot of software that controls telescopes will have what they call a virtual mount or a 3D view on the PC. So when I uh, did this snapshot earlier today, this is the way that my telescope was pointing. So this end is actually where the lens is. So I have a point down when I park and this is a graphic of the mount. Now, when I tell the mount, the mount to slew to something, I can actually see that this is moving. Um, cameras are also very useful to look at and even to hear your equipment. So if I'm not quite sure, like, how do I know this virtual mount is really working? Well, I can look at it with my camera. Or if it's not moving, is it the red light that's flashing on the mount or is it the blue light that's flashing? That's where a camera can come in real helpful, especially if the camera has zoom. In my, my case, I've got three cameras on the inside of the observatory, so this is one of them. Uh, it's on the north wall and it faces the front of my telescopes. So I can see the, the front and the back of the telescope. So I, at any point I can see whether or not something's wrong with the telescopes. And hearing um, is actually useful too. I can tell just by hearing when the roof is opening and when the mount is slewing and other stuff like that. And my one mount, my red mount, uh, if there's a problem, it actually makes noise. It beeps or something like that. Um, and so that's nice to be able to hear that as well. And then you want to consider having a sensor or sensors that will close the roof in unsafe conditions. And I'll show you in the next slide um, some examples of that. So is it safe to image? Well, how, how do you know if you can image? Um, you know, you can look up uh, on a temperature app, what the temperature, what the cloud cover is, but nothing beats actually having your own uh, little weather monitor and camera, ideally. So you would definitely want to consider wind and even more important is a rain sensor or sensors, plural, for redundancy. And in my case, I have um, this thing, which I put up the last time I was there. I've got a three foot by three foot by 18 inches of concrete, which with my first job with concrete, and it's it's a backbreaking experience if you ever had to do it. Um, the actual monitoring here is about 18 feet up in the air, and this is a close up of it. So I actually have a uh, wind gauge here, and this little box is called the Sky Alert. Um, it has a rain sensor, cloud detector, humidity, temperature, um, brightness basically everything on this graph. So this is a graph and I can see this from home because I actually have this unit um, upload the graph every minute to my website. So I just get on my website before I'm thinking about taking pictures and I look at this and say, oh, the wind speed. Um, so last, the 20th, I think last night is when the wind was really high. It was pretty consistently high. And one thing I need to be careful with a fairly large roof is making sure I can close it in the wind. So I have this set to uh, to close the roof when it gets somewhat windy, but before it gets super windy. Um, I don't know if you can see the little dome here, but I have what's called an all sky camera. So it's a camera that's in here and I have a little Raspberry Pi. The camera points up at the cloud so I can see if it's cloudy where I am. And it takes about a 180 degree field of view. So I can see basically from, uh, well, in fact, I can see from horizon to horizon. Um, do you want to close the roof automatically? It's a good question. Um, I do have a wind sensor that you can't see. There's a wind sensor behind the roof here that is hooked up 
um, to close the roof when the wind gets too high. That, and that uses no software. It's just a physical mechanical connection that closes the roof if it gets too windy. Um, a unit like this requires software. So it, to me, it adds is, it's a good backup to the primary one. Um, this will also close if there's rain. Um, the sensor here, and I'll show you in a moment, I have another sensor that can close the roof if there's rain. Um, but that's a question you want to ask yourself. I mean, if you're remote, you probably want the roof to close automatically when it senses wind or rain. And redundancy is the key. So if you have you know, one rain sensor and it goes out, and you don't know it goes out until you visit there and you see watermarks everywhere and you know, a half an inch of water in your observatory, um, you may want to consider a second sensor. They're, they're not real expensive. It's definitely worth the hassle. Right? So here's a quiz, and I'd like people to uh, put their answers in, in the Facebook chat or email them. This is this rain sensor. Oops, the arrow's a little off here. The rain sensor is in my observatory. So why would I have a rain sensor inside my observatory? So I'll let you put the answers there, and I'll continue. So other planning and building considerations, rain and dust. Um, so you really should assume that your rain sensor or sensors won't work or they won't work fast enough. Um, in my case, it takes about 30 seconds, almost exactly 30 seconds to open and close the roof. So if a rain sensor detects rain, it may start pouring you know, within a couple of seconds. And my roof taking 30 seconds, I'm going to get hit with some rain. I mean, not a whole lot, but still, I'll get, I'll get some rain. So because of that, you really want to put everything you can in bins. You can see here I've got you know, some boxes and whatnot in bins. I've got almost everything that can go in a bin in a bin. Um, things that, and here's another example here. I actually have my uh, router, my power bricks, and some other things in this bin. Um, I took the cover. The cover is right here. I put the cover on. And I actually had cut a whole bunch of holes in the sides of this to keep it from overheating. Um, so I put the cover on when I'm not there. Um, things that you can't put in bins, you probably want to cover. So I bought some of this plastic. It's actually used to go underneath the floor of showers. So it's, it's very thick. Um, and I've got it kind of moved back here. When I'm there, I move it back. When I come home, I pull this down. So that if it does rain, there's not going to get rain on uh, the equipment that's in here. And the goal of this is to keep the rain and, and the dust out, not to look pretty. So, you know, these things don't look real pretty. This doesn't look all that, you know, fantastic, but it's protected. Other things to consider. Um, this is a network switch. If you can see this little black thing here, it's a plug that goes into the unused ports. These things are dirt cheap. You can get them on Amazon by, I think, a bag of 100 or something. Um, you know, put them in there. That'll just help keep dust out of um, some stuff. Um, some PCs, like the ones I've got, have dust filters. Um, I suggest you clean them every time you're there. They, they do actually help. Uh, as I showed in that picture earlier, um, suggest parking your scope in a downward facing position to lessen the amount of dust that it gets on. And if you have a do shield, do shields also help keep the dust out when they're in the downward facing position. Um, some people actually have a motorized lens cover. Um, I don't in my case, but you can get them. I've heard from some people that they're not real reliable. You know, they're good maybe for a intermediate observatory where if it doesn't work, you can drive out there on the weekend. In my case, you know, I only go there a couple times a year, so I don't want any problems with that. And if you have something like a, some kind of hole in the wall, for instance, for a fan, you want to have some kind of filter over that to help keep the dust out. And obviously, some kind of screen to help keep animals out. Um, critters. So this actually is a real uh, issue for a lot of people. Luckily, in my case so far, it has not been. But um, I've only been using mine for a year. So you know, talk to me a year from now, I may have a different, uh, a different story. But you want to close as many openings as, and gaps as you can. Um, you can get various sprays for the perimeter of the observatory, um, both inside and outside. Um, if you have mice and other similar rodents, mice traps uh, can help. And those kind of rodents tend to like wires. 
So you run the real risk of having wires uh, chewed on and potentially short circuited. Um, I do get, actually I get wasps in my observatory. So far they have not built a nest and I've only seen a few, but uh, I have heard stories of other people that had uh, bees nests in their observatory. And uh, Jim, I know you'll like this. The snakes are common in the boonies. I have actually not seen any, which is great because I know by me there's uh, rattlesnakes exist, although I think they only see one every couple of years. So power, what do you can do about power? Well, I'm making the assumption that you're doing astrophotography. So you've got some kind of power in the internet, but um, as I mentioned earlier, search protectors and this little black box on top here is, is a search protector. Um, I have a few of those. Um, they help for lightning strikes and just if the power itself coming from the company has a surge, it'll help with that. I consider a UPS a must. And I actually, I actually have three. There's two of them here. I've got one for my one peer, another for the other, the peer, which includes the mount, the camera, the PC, the monitor. Uh, another one uh, for my other peer. And then I have a third UPS just for my network equipment. Uh, because I want my observatory to be able to function even if the power is out for a short period of time. These will last. Um, about an hour and a half for me, um, but at least get a UPS that lasts for a minute or so. Typically, a power outage is a very quick, it's down and then back up within a second or two. And that's really what you need to be able to, uh, to go to ride through. Um, these piece, or these UPSs are uh, APC, and I think probably most UPSs allow you to connect them to the PC with a USB cord. So the UPS can notify the PC uh, to gra gracefully shut down. And that also then would include, you know, telling your mount to park and, and other fun stuff like that. Um, remote control of your outlets is very helpful. I use this all the time. In fact, that's how I open up the roof. Um, by turning on an outlet, it opens the roof, turn another outlet, or I turn the outlet off, it closes the roof, stuff like that. Um, you can control your mount this way, turn it on and off. In fact, just today I, I power cycled one of the mounts because I thought I had an issue. I actually ended up was clicking on the wrong button. But um, you know, camera sometimes uh, cameras and other things with with other things with USB connections. Uh, the USB connection will kind of just hang, and the only way around that is either disconnect the cable or power cycle the device. So you can do that. Um, the PC, obviously you don't want to power, well, you can power cycle your PC remotely. You don't want to turn it off because you won't be able to get it back on. But um, this device from a company called Digital Loggers, and I have I have like five or six of these in the observatory. Um, one option is to turn something on, turn an outlet off or power cycle it. So if I tell it to power cycle to see the PC, this device has, a, has some brains It'll turn the outlet off, wait a few seconds, and turn it back on. Um, you can control fans. So I actually have a fan I can I can turn on after I open the roof to help cool things down. And one nice thing that I like about this is uh, this device. And I, to be honest, I didn't check other brands because other people in my community are using these. But um, it has it can run scripts. Um, so I actually have a script that will close the roof every morning about 45 minutes before sunrise. So even if my PC forgets to tell the, the roof to close, this will automatically close it. Um, we have a question. So, yeah. Okay, yeah. we've got a slight echo there too. Yeah, question? Yep, we got a question. Um, how often have you physically observed from there? And has anything failed which needed a repair trip? So observe meaning observe like visually observe. I've I've never done visual there because when I took the telescopes there, um, I didn't even bring my eyepieces. Although I have obviously gone outside and looked. But um, in terms of astrophotography, I'm on a record right now. I think I've done it the last nine nights. I was able to get pictures, you know, most or all of the night. Um, usually it's maybe three or four nights out of a week I can get pictures. 
Um, I did find um, New Mexico and Arizona and some of those places have what they call a monsoon season. And when they say it rains a lot, they mean it. When I was there in, let's see, June and July, it was in the middle of the monsoon season. It was actually early. And I think the four weeks I was there, I was able to image like three times, three or four times. It rained literally almost every day for part of the day, not, not the whole day. Um, but I, I think year round, I, I will probably average three or four nights a week that I'll be able to image, maybe, maybe closer to three, which is pretty good compared to, uh, say, Naperville, which you're looking at maybe one, <laughs> two. Um, in terms of things that broke, yeah, I had my all sky camera um, break. Well, not break, break, but um, um, the power to it got disconnected somehow. And so right, like right now it's, it's not working. So I have not been able to look at any pictures. I plan on going out there in October and I'll uh, resolve that. In my case, it's not that big of a deal because there's a place about half a mile away called New Mexico Skies that rents out telescopes or rents out piers and they have an all sky camera. So if I wanna see what the clouds are like, I just look at their camera. Um, I have had uh, a couple pieces of equipment break. Um, one of them I just got back. So when I was there in June, I, I took it off and brought it home and sent it in and it's, it's back. So I'll, uh, I'll put it back on the scope when I get out there in, in October so. Um, other stuff, I've had the power go out quite a few times. It's only been out twice uh, where it was long enough to actually, you know, drain the UPSs. Um, but it has gone out many times, unfortunately, you know, for just a few seconds. But um, I just ride right through those. In fact, I can keep the imaging even if the power is out for, you know, a short time because of the UPSs I have. Um, I initially had the roof. At one point, I couldn't open the roof, and um, when the guy who built it, who's a couple doors down, went and checked, he found that there was a slight, uh, there's a little bit, a bit of play. When the roof closes, there's a lock, and that locking mechanism has a little bit of play, and that was causing, the, causing me not to actually be able to open the roof. So we ended up adding, and this is another redundancy thing, we ended up adding a magnet. So when the roof closes, it's an extremely powerful magnet. It can hold, uh, I think it's 1,200 pounds, will lock the roof closed. And then when I go to open the roof, I actually use this device and the script says, okay, to open the roof, I need to unlock it. I need to turn the magnet off and then I need to tell the motor to start opening it. And so it does those three things. So that was something, this little bit of play was a breakage, but that only kept me from imaging one night till the guy had a chance to go out and, and check it out, so. Um, other stuff for planning and, and building. Uh, can the observatory function without internet access? Um, in my case, it can. Now, obviously I, well, in my case, I need to tell it to start, but I can tell it to start or I can, set it up so that it starts. I could do it right now if I knew it was gonna be clear tonight, or well, I guess it's almost dark. I could do it right now for tomorrow because I can have the roof automatically open at a certain time. Um, oops. Because again, this thing I can program into here, open the roof at you know 2 p.m. tomorrow or whatever, 8 p.m. tomorrow. Um, and I don't actually need internet access to do anything other than to tell it to start. Um, and obviously once things are done, I need it to get to grab my pictures. Um, I suggest you use wired connections for everything um, if, if possible. They're definitely more reliable than, than Wi-Fi. Um, I use Wi-Fi for my phone and my laptop when I'm visiting, but everything else is cabled. And in my case, uh, when the guy built the thing, he put uh, three conduits uh, from one side underneath the concrete to each pier. So I can easily run on cables and I don't have to worry about cables on the floor. Talking about cables, get the best ones you can. Cables do break, even when they're just sitting there doing nothing, they seem to break. Um, especially USB cables seem to be notoriously poor quality. Um, try to get them 
just the right length. You know, don't make them longer, especially USB cables, because the longer it is, the, the more signal loss you get, the more chance of a problem. But err on the side of too long rather than too short. Um, I've actually had it uh, where I had a couple of cables that were a little bit too short, and I could I could use it, but I, I had to put my PC up on a stand so it would fit and the hassle. So I eventually took those out and put the ones that were like a foot or two longer in. Shielded cables are the best, and that's primarily uh, for lightning protection. Um, I suggest keeping a container of lots of spare cables, you know, different types of cables, USB, Ethernet cables, links, connectors. You know, USB has the A, the B, the mini, the micro, the C, the I don't know how many different connectors. Um, I have used, the, used various connectors a lot of times. So I'm glad that I've got the spares that I've been collecting over the years. And then tie down everything. Tie down all your cables, not just the ones on your camera, but the ones where you peer and everything. Because you really don't want to catch something on a cable and have something fall over because of that. Um, suggest you label everything. So in my case, um, as you may have seen on my diagram here, um, I label all the outlets. This is breaker three. This is for my cameras only. I have some that are um, only two amps. And so I shouldn't do like I did last time is accidentally plug a vacuum into them and it blew the, the fuse. Um, I also have others that are 15 amps. So just label everything. Uh, and part of that is, so when you're there or somebody else is there, and part of it is since you're not there that often, you might forget you know, what cable goes where and what's plugged into what. So if you label it, um, you're just going to run into less problems overall. And then consider having a network or electric diagram. So I've used Visio before, um, which is what I used to create this. So I actually created this before I went there because I wanted to be able, and I printed this and took it with me so that when I got there, I knew what wires were gonna go where and what it was gonna connect to and whatnot, um, partially so that I could count the wires and well, I guess I didn't really know the lengths until I got there, but I knew the wires that I needed. I knew what kind of connectors they all needed to be, um, all that kind of stuff. And it actually was relatively straightforward once I got there. I just looked at this and plugged stuff in. Um, in my case, because there is a guy that's a couple of houses away and I can call on him if I absolutely need to, giving him this diagram helps him as well. Or in your case, if you've got uh, somebody that needs to go in your absence, if they have a diagram like this, that will help them as well. And then consider a spare, uh, spare keyboard, mouse, you know, other kind of equipment. Uh, keyboards are like 10 bucks, mice are five, you know, for just a, a cheap one. You don't need a gaming mouse and a real fancy keyboard when you're remote because you're not going to be using it very often. I actually did have one of my keyboards that I got with the PC was bad. So I just bought a spare and now I just keep a spare in one of my bins. Um, you know, in my case, I'm 45 minutes away from the nearest town, so I'd rather spend the 10 bucks on a keyboard than the 10 bucks on the gas to go into town. Uh, visiting the observatory. So hopefully you're going to visit, uh, you know, how often you're going to visit. Um, in my case, I don't quite know yet. I'm thinking probably two times a year, three times maybe. Um, I've only been using it for a year and the times that I have visited, I've still been doing stuff like putting a lot of the cables in conduit just so it looks nicer and I don't have cables kind of dangling on the walls. Um, you know, I put my all sky monitor or all sky camera and the, the wind and rain uh, sensors up when I was there. So I'm still kind of doing some of the building stuff. I think once that's done, I probably only will have to go there maybe once a year and that'll just to be be to do general maintenance, but I will likely go there multiple times because you know, I've got the observatory, so I enjoy going there. Um, definitely have a list of items you need to take and return. So in my case, a vacuum cleaner. You know, I'm not going to buy a vacuum cleaner and let it sit in the observatory. So I'll just take it in the car with me. And I, on the list, I have a list of things I need to make sure I bring home, and that's one of them. Um, I've got a lot of other stuff to take. Um, some of the stuff is, you know, th this trip only, like I need a new XYZ cable. Make sure you put it on the list, otherwise it's likely you're going to forget it. Um, and then I've got some things that I take all the time, like the vacuum cleaner. 
Um, so when you visit, what are you going to do? Well, I've been keeping a list of, uh, of things to do. And I update this list every time I think of it, something to do. I've got the list on my phone. I just get in the phone and, and add it. Um, you know, if I had a problem last night uh, with my telescope guiding or something, I might put down, uh, check out the guiding or, you know, focus the guide camera. It seems a little out of focus. You know, so little things up to big things. I actually want to move, physically move one of my peers because I got a bigger telescope and its dew shield can touch the dew shield of the first scope. So I've got that on my list. You know, move it a foot to the right and two feet back or whatever it is. So this is very important. Otherwise, you very much run the risk of forgetting to do something, getting home and saying, oh, shoot. Um, observatory maintenance strongly suggests that you have a list of maintenance tasks. And this can be in your to-do list. Um, you know, what, what things you need to do every year? How about every visit, every two years? Um, you know, a couple of things in my case, that, because I'm, a, I'm kind of at the desert mountains, it tends to be dusty. Um, so I vacuum, not just the floor, but I get the vacuum uh, attachment out and I vacuum everything. I don't vacuum the lens, but the outsides of the telescope, the mounds, everything I can find, I'll vacuum. I'll also mop the floor just so that when I'm in there, I'm not uh, bringing up a whole lot of dust. Um, I've got something every couple of years, the manufacturer suggests that I re-grease the gears in the, uh, in the mounts. So I've got that on my list, a whole bunch of stuff for the observatory itself. Um, so your equipment, um, you know, re-grease, check the bolts, make sure things are still tight. Some of the equipment stuff also would be polar lining, which is aligning the telescope with the, the North Pole or South Pole if you're in the, in the Southern Hemisphere. Um, you know, over time, your peer or your peer and or your floor may settle a little bit and that'll throw the alignment off. Um, in fact, in mine, um, I had it very, very well aligned. And I notice now my deck axis is drifting just a teeny bit, not enough to cause any issues. In fact, I'm still getting very, very round stars, but it's something that I have on my list um, to do another polar alignment and, and tweak that a little bit. And then assuming your observatory is on some land that you owned, you need to probably do some kind of maintenance on the, the land itself or the area. So in my case, I remove dead branches. Um, I have a chipper that will chip them, and so I make mulch out of, out of them. Um, I like to weed right around the observatory. I don't go out in the field and weed, obviously, but you know, around the observatory just so the weeds don't overgrow the, uh, the rock that's there. And it's partially just for looks. And, there may be other things on the main, on the ground, the equipment or observatory for your maintenance. So when you're visiting, where are you going to stay? Um, so in my case, I don't have a house, although I'm, I'm considering getting one, but I'm trying to weigh the decision of spending a lot of money in a house that I, I'm not going to use that often versus spending money on, you know, staying in a cabin a couple of miles down the road. But it is something to consider. Um, if you're out in the boonies, and the nearest place to stay is an hour away, you know, maybe you want to consider a, an RV. You know, but it's something to consider where you're going to stay. Bathroom facilities. We won't say much about this other than you need to consider it. You're not going to be able to last all day if you're in there. Uh, in my case, um, there actually is a rec center in the community that I can use. Um, I'm also used to being outdoors, so there's lots of trees, but uh, that's not for everyone. So it's definitely something to consider. Eric, we, uh, yes. we have another question. Okay. Uh, kind of what you were just talking about. Uh, how do you deal with dust blowing into open roof, covering, you know, covering the telescope lens, et cetera? It's not like you answered that, but when you're not well, there, or do you just take flats and it doesn't matter much? Um, the well, so the dust does blow in. In fact, I get dust even when the, everything is closed because there are some gaps that I'm slowly closing. Uh, although I also have noticed when I'm there and the roof is closed, I usually leave the door open just so I get some light and I get dust in that way. So I'm kind of in the process of building a screen that will screen out some of the dust at least. Um, but when the roof is open, um, 
typically at night, it's not as windy, so not as much dust blows in, but you still, when I get there, everything is dusty. The lenses have not, not been as dusty as I would have thought. And I think partially because let's just say I'm imaging, let's just say three nights a week for eight hours. It's 24 hours in a week that the um, lens or the telescope is pointing up. The other, however many hours, it's pointing down. And when it points down, it gets very little dust. So I think just because if you look at it, uh, you know, the course of a day, you're not pointing up as often as you think. But um, I do have, um, you know, one of those little blow things that you use, like to keep, keep uh, clean a camera lens that I'll use. Um, I've used a vacuum. I make sure that I do not you know, touch the lens itself, but I kind of put it in the dew shield and vacuum around and then use the, the little blower at the same time. Um, and then I have used a microfiber on my Celestron. Actually, I guess on my Mead, which is similar to Celestron. I've used a microfiber on that. But, um, so for me, it hasn't been a significant problem, but it is something that's on my list to, to you know, check them at least. Another thing to consider is dust on the front lens usually will not be an issue in your images because it'll be out of focus. So you don't need to use flats for that. Um, what it will do is in effect decrease the amount of light that you're getting. And typically it has to be really dirty before the decrease is noticeable. But if you do have dust, um, you know, on the sensor or whatnot, um, your flats that you talked about, Chris, you know, you know, will help with that. Does that answer the question? I think it does. Okay, thanks. Um, creature comforts. So you're there, and you know, my case, I guess last time I, I was there for a little over three weeks. You know, I figure if I'm gonna spend two and a half days to get there, two and a half days to get back, I might as well stay there a long time. And right now I'm, I'm, I'm retired so I can afford to do that. Uh, comfortable chair. <laughs> You're going to be sitting at that in that thing a long time. Make sure it's comfortable. Um, music. I have actually an Amazon Echo and uh, we have Spotify so I can play you know music when I'm there. It's, it's not the same as the stereo but it sure is convenient. And I also uh, can use my Echo to uh, open and close the roof which is nice and turn the fan on and do some other things. Um, a fan not just to cool it when you're not there, like to cool down your telescope, but uh, to cool you down. Um, my experience is I tend not to have the roof open when I'm there during the day, uh, partially because the sun is beating down. You know, when you're 7,200 feet up in the mountain, you need to worry about sun, uh, you know, getting sunburnt. But also it's so bright that I can't see the monitor. So I usually have the roof closed, in which case it can get you know, warm inside. Uh, and so I have a fan that just blows some air around. It was a fan I bought at uh, Walmart for 20 bucks, something like that, $25. Um, something else to consider, as you probably know, at night it can get cold. Um, I have a couple of blankets um, that I use for various things, including when I'm sitting there at the chair, I'll put a blanket over me. Um, uh, I have a to-do list for things to do when you're leaving. So, you know, turn off the power for anything that you're not going to be using, like the Echo. You know, the less things you, you have powered up, the less chance you're going to have a problem. Um, cover and put away items. So in my case, um, this is my mouse. I put the mouse in a little plastic bag that I had, and I just kind of glued on a couple of uh, magnetic strips here to keep it closed. And then I actually put, I take this off the table and put it down next to the PC so that if there's a big wind, it won't blow this off. Um, for the monitor, um, that same plastic that I use over the network equipment, um, I made a thing like this, basically folded it in half and then glued it together with um, pipe kind of glue, PVC type of glue. And this is thick enough that um, it, it doesn't, uh, blow in the wind, it doesn't move much. And I actually made uh, made this kind of cover for the, the keyboards as well. I just don't have a picture of that. So again, when you leave, you want to have everything put away. Um, I had bought a ladder 
one of those real tall ladders last time I was there because it's, it's too tall to, to fit in a car all the time. Um, and when I left, I had accidentally left it outside, which is not good because I came back and it was on the ground. Um, so I put that on my list of things to make sure I put in the observatory before I, I go home. So using it remotely. So there's various remote control software you can use, AnyDesk, TeamViewer, whatever. Um, I install, I have installed AnyDesk and TeamViewer. I have had a case where one of them didn't work and the other did. If you ever get in a situation where you can't remotely connect to your computer in the observatory, your SOL, unless you've got somebody there that can uh, fix it for you. Um, interesting, some of these things, like I think TeamViewer only works if you have a monitor connected to the PC and turned on. And in my case, I don't want to have my monitor turned on, partially the electricity, but also even when a monitor is on, but the screen is black, the screen is still producing light. And you, it's a noticeable amount of light when it's really dark. So you can buy these little things here at the end of this yellow thing. It's just a little adapter. It's called a ghost monitor. They're, I don't know, five bucks or 10 bucks on Amazon. Um, basically, it plugs into the, in my case, the, um, the display port, uh, port. I've got two of them on this, this PC. The red one goes to the monitor and then this one. And it basically mimics a powered on monitor. So I can have my red cable going to the monitor turned off. This one thinks it's on. And I can then use TeamViewer to remotely uh, connect into the computer. That was something, luckily, I learned about this when I was at home. And I learned about it when I came home. Um, I would have had a couple of months of uh, unusable observatory. Um, cameras, like I mentioned earlier, are very useful to, um, to look at your equipment and to hear the equipment. Um, Zoom is on the cameras is very helpful. I've been able to zoom in where I could make out each individual light on the back of the mount, which is helpful when deb debugging problems. Um, one question you need to decide is do you leave your equipment on all the time or turn it off? There's a couple of camps on this. I actually leave mine on. Um, when it's outdoors like that, in various temperatures, uh, it can be actually easier for equipment to be left on all the time especially the camera, which is cooled. Um, you don't want the sensor to warm up and then cool down and warm up and cool down because that's what breaks them. Um, so I just leave mine on all the time. It, it doesn't use that much extra power, you know, especially the PC when it's, it's basically sitting idle most of the day, it doesn't use a whole lot of power. And I figure if uh, I spend 50 bucks extra on power a year, that's better than spending you know, 5,000 on a new camera because the electronics fried because they get turned on and off all the time. But like I said, that's, you know, there's different camps on that. Most of the people I think in my community do in fact leave everything on and they rarely have problems with hardware breaking or with electronics breaking. So how do you know if the roof's open? So there's a couple of ways. So this is a, a sky roof, which connects into my sky alert, the thing with the, uh, rain sensor and whatnot to actually close the roof. So this device, in my case, can close the roof. It also can tell me if the roof is open or if it is opening. And then I've got this, uh, what's called a limit switch here. So there's a couple of ways that you can determine if the roof is open or closed. One is you can do it a manual way with a camera. So this top part on the picture here is the part of the roof that opens. There's the beam here that the the wheels roll on, and then the bottom part is the wall of the observatory. And this is just an enlargement. So I've got two arrows here, and my camera points almost exactly at these arrows. So I can look in the camera, and if these arrows you know, are like this, the roof is closed, and it's closed all the way. So that's one way, but I have to log into the computer in the observatory, look at the camera, um, which you can't always do. Another way is, but that's, it's a very inexpensive way. These labels are what, a half a cent each. Um, I already have the camera in my case. So it's, it's an easy and an inexpensive way. A more automated way in my case is these limit switches. This um, spring rod 
bend. So this um, nut or bolt here on the roof. So when the roof is closing, it's coming from the left to the right. The steel rod points straight up. This bolt pushes it when it gets to a certain point, in this case, almost exactly where it is here. It throws a switch inside, a mechanical switch, which then tells the software that the roof is closed. And when the roof starts opening, this, of course, is going to go to the left. Uh, this rod will start straightening. And after just a little bit, a quarter of an inch, maybe, if that, it'll throw the switch the other way, which says the roof is no longer closed. Now, it hasn't said the roof is open yet or it's fully open. I have another um, one of these limit switches outside. And the, this same bolt pushes that rod to the left. And so when that happens, the software then knows that the roof is fully open. So I know when it's fully open, when the one outside says it is, when it's fully closed, when the one inside says it is, and when it's somewhere in between, either it's moving or I've opened it halfway and stopped it. Now, the software for this sky roof, when I tell it to open the roof, um, it sends a signal to the roof to open it. Actually, it sends a HTML command to tell the power switch to have it open. But it knows the roof takes about 30 seconds. So when it senses that the, the rod has moved and the roof is no longer closed, it starts to count down. And if after 30 or 35 seconds, the roof is not fully open, I get a message saying it's taken too long. Now, that might be because I stopped the roof because I want to only have it halfway open. It may also be because there's snow and the roof can't open or whatever the reason, but it's nice to know. Um, this device also will send me a text every time the roof opens or closes or, yeah, I guess opens or closes. So if I were to tell it to open right now, within a couple of seconds, I get a text. So you really want some way to monitor whether or not your roof is open or closed, even if you just do it with a camera. Um, you really need, need to do that. Otherwise, you're going to never know. And not opening is not nearly as bad as not closing. You want to make sure the roof closes. That's really the number one thing with a remote observatory, that roof has to close. And you have to know that it closed. So this is a screenshot. Uh, in fact, I got the screenshot um, right now. I'm running the, I run any desk primarily. Um, it's free, same with TeamViewer, free. And I've got a whole bunch of windows here. Um, this is my little 3D view, so I can tell that the telescope is pointing down and this tells me how well I'm guiding. Um, I'm, I'm getting less than a quarter of a pixel error, which is extremely good. People would die for that uh, quality. I'm just, I'm lucky that I've got that good. This is the last picture. Um, it's the hydrogen alpha picture. That's why you can't see much detail. And then these other things just tell me, you know, take uh, 14 shots of green and X number of blue and all that kind of fun stuff. So I can control it here. I can tell the software start. It knows how many of every color filter I want, how long the exposures are. In this case, I don't know if you can see this, but these are all 900 seconds. So these are 15 minute exposures. Uh, the repeat is how many to take, 3, 8, 2, 10, whatever. What filter to use, a green, a blue, and S2, blah, blah, blah. On the Eagle target, M16 Eagle. And then when that's done, it goes to an NGC item. When that's done, it goes to M33 in my case. And I obviously change these as the season changes. But what I do typically is I start the sequence. Well, I tell it to start typically 7 o'clock before it's actually fully dark. Uh, and I say, don't start the first pictures until 8.45 when it's fully dark there. So the software then, you know, I can then go off and go to sleep if I want. The software waits to 8.45 and then it starts taking the pictures and it, it does all the stuff. When it's done, it will tell the roof to close and it'll tell the mount or the, yeah, the mount to park. Um, there's all sorts of software you can use for remotely uh, controlling an observatory and the camera and equipment in it. Um, this is just one example. So I think the most important thing to have fun. I mean, remember, this is a hobby. Um, you know, it's not work. 
well, it can be a lot, a lot of work, but it, it can be even more fun. And I've had a great time. I actually really like being in my observatory. When I'm there, I feel like I'm at home. Um, you know, so it's kind of like my man cave, if you will, but also I really enjoy getting the pictures, uh, especially when you get like nine days straight of, of pictures is really great. Um, so that's it for my talk. I think we're doing okay time-wise. Eric, yeah. Mm -hmm. Eric, you did have some answers to your question. Regarding oh, the yeah, okay. Yeah. Okay, so yeah, good. Let me go back. One person uh, responded with leaks or from when the roof is open and it starts raining. Others say humidity release and critters. Those are the... Okay, did you say leaks, L-E-A-K-S? Yes. Okay, and what was the last one, critters? Yeah, critters. Okay, well, good. So I kind of view three reasons. So when the roof is open, the, the sensor is no longer outside. Or I'm sorry, it's no longer inside, it's outside. Okay, and remember, I have another one of these exact same things outside about uh, 20 feet in the air. You, I didn't actually have a picture, it was behind the roof. So again, I have redundancy, I have two of them. Um, I don't need it during the day. Well, actually I do, I suppose. If the roof is open during the day and I'm off, you know, cutting some branches and it starts raining, it'll automatically close. Again, this, this unit does not require any software. It's, it's physically connected into the motor, or not physically, but electrically connected into it. So. When the roof is open, this is outside. Another is uh, redundancy I mentioned, but a third, and this has happened, if you have both of them outside, you may get birds come and poop on them. And if they poop on both of them, your, your roof will never open. Because these sensors, by the way, also keep the roof from opening if it senses rain. So it's not just to close it, but it's to keep it from opening. So you got bird poop on both of them. Now, if you have one of them inside like this, Again, it's only exposed to the outside, the same as the mount at the telescope pointing up in my example earlier, you know, 24 hours a week. Um, first of all, birds tend not to be flying around a whole lot at night. And if it's only 24 hours a week, the chance of a bird pooping on it is very, very low. So good, the people that answered, I think got the, got the gist of it. So thank you to those people that did answer. Oops. Any other questions? I'm not seeing any right now, Eric. Okay. Yeah, there. I'll, I'll interrupt, Chris. There are two uh, two more questions. How long were you in uh, New Mexico getting the observatory built and configured? I know you said you had somebody else do it, but how long? How long were you there doing stuff yourself? So it took, uh, geez, two and a half years to build. Um, that was primarily because the guy that was building it, the guy a couple houses away, had a quad bypass in the middle of it. So he was out, he was out of pocket for like nine months. And then even when he came back, uh, he could usually work in the morning and by the afternoon he was too exhausted to work. So just, he didn't have a whole lot of time. So I think if he had, you know, if this had been five years ago, he probably would have been able to finish it in about six months because he has built several of them. Um, I was actually never there while it was being built. I was there when the gravel was down and compacted. And then the next time I was there was when the observatory was completed and I brought my equipment with me to you know, put on the, on the piers and hook up and all that kind of fun stuff. Um, it took me, that, see that time I was there for a little over three weeks, um, hooking the equipment up, uh, you know, getting used to stuff, having him explain to me, you know, how the roof operates, you know, how the electricity is, you know, all that kind of stuff. Because there's a lot of stuff to take in on your first day your first time you're there. So um, since then, I have been, I guess every time I've gone, it's for been around three weeks. And that's, you know, largely a function of how long it takes to get there and get back. It's just not worth going there for a week if you're going to spend five days driving. Um, 
And so far, I've been very busy when I'm there. In fact, I really have not even done any sightseeing. That's something I'd like to do uh, the next time I go is, you know, if I go for three weeks, spend hopefully only spend two weeks on the observatory and whatnot and spend, you know, weeks sightseeing. You know, I still have some stuff like I need to put the camera back on the camera that was broken and the telescope itself, the focus lock, uh, yeah, the focus lock, or, I'm sorry, the mirror lock broke. This was a 16 inch telescope. So I had to bring that home and ship it back in. And, you know, so I have to put those back on um, and I'll move the pier, as I said earlier. So that'll take some amount of time. But... Uh, there's two others. Uh... Do you are you comfortable saying a, a ballpark uh, figure on what uh, what things cost? Um, yeah, so the observatory, I mean the building, which included the electricity, three cameras, the two rain sensors, the wind sensor. Trying to think uh, all the other stuff he kind of included in it. Actually, look here. Um, he charged me like fifty-five thousand for that, for the, the physical thing and the building and the designing of it. Um, you know, I he he did all the stuff above board, so you know went through all the inspections. You know, had a certified uh, electrician, and you know we went to the county to or the electric company to get the electricity. So it's all above board. You know, and that adds some time and, and some cost. But um, yeah, so fairly expensive. I mean, one thing you consider though, on the top of a mountain, everything is expensive. Um, you know, how do you get stuff up there? It's far, it's an hour, you know, 45 minutes to an hour from the nearest anything. So just getting stuff is a hassle. You know, UPS and, Am and uh, Amazon take three or four days rather than one day. So yeah, that was uh, around 55,000. Oh, and that also included, you know, putting the gravel. And I had them put, uh, I had them raise the observatory about three feet off the, the ground, which added, you know, five grand or something to that. And that was kind of to help get above the trees. And if I put a house there, it would be above the house. And then all the equipment inside uh, a fortune. I, I'm trying to think. The insurance people, I told them 116000 and I think that included the observatory itself. So I have it insured for 116000 and that's basically everything in this spreadsheet. When I sum up the cost, the cost for it new was like 116. And I have been pretty, pretty good about putting everything in here. So I even have things like my ladder, a mop, you know, and again, this is, partially just for insurance so i make sure i get all my money but also so i know what i have there in case i need to replace it and now you... keep sorry jim keep in mind i've got two two telescopes so if you had just one it would be you know it wouldn't be half the price because you have the observatory but you know i basically have to have two of everything two ups two two surge protectors two computers you know two peers two tables two chairs blah 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 did you consider uh, renting time on an observatory versus building your own and any suggestions on renting before building one or trying out remote photography? Yeah, that's a very good question. And I actually did. I used um, I, I Telescope uh, is a company and they have telescopes all over the world in the Canary Islands. I don't know if they have any in Chile. They have some in Australia. They actually have some telescopes in New Mexico skies, the place that's about a half a mile from where I am. So I'm actually in New Mexico skies enclave and they're New Mexico skies. Um, so I use them for a couple of years. You know, it's somewhat expensive. Um, I forget what to pay, 10 bucks an hour or something, but it depends a lot on how many hours you get. You know, so if you say I want the 40 hour a week plan, or I forget what the hours were, you get, you know, less per hour. Um, I, I did consider whether or not I should continue renting uh, or not. Now with iTelescope, you, they have a, you know, a calendar and you go and schedule, I want this scope. Well, if that scope is busy for the next five days, you have to wait. 
So I probably wouldn't do that. I mean, that was great for what I did, you know, because I didn't have an observatory and I wanted to try out different kinds of telescopes because they have, you know, small telescopes, they have huge telescopes, they have inexpensive ones, they have really expensive ones, you know, very, I think they've got 20 or 30 telescopes. So they have a very good variety and different cameras and stuff. Um, I think the thing to consider if you're doing a kind of a cost benefit analysis for should I have an observatory or not is, is not something like I telescope. It's more something like at New Mexico skies, you actually rent a pier. So they've got a huge roll off observe, they have a couple of roll offs and then they also have some domes. Um, and you in effect are renting a pier. And then with that comes some number of hours of support. So you have to go down there with all your equipment, you hook it up, um, and then you have internet access to it. So that's something, if you do that, obviously you can use it anytime you want. Now they determine whether or not the roof is open or closed, um, which is fine. But other than that, you get to determine. So really, I think what, what you want to do is say, okay, an observatory will cost me, let's just say 50000 uh, if I were to use like New Mexico skies, and let's just say, I'm just going to throw out 5,000 a year. Okay, so that's 10 years I can use it for the same cost as, as buying an observatory. You know, and then you say, well, you know, how old am I? Am I going to be wanting to do this in 10 years? You know, and so you kind of can do a cost benefit analysis. Now, what that doesn't tell you is the joy that you get from having something that you can call it yours. And in my case, you know, I have to admit that part of it is I wanted someplace I could say was mine. And I telescope, you know, I would develop the pictures and kind of feel almost like I was cheating because it wasn't my stuff, although that's, you know, that's not true. And if you're at New Mexico skies, it's your camera and stuff, but it's not your observatory. So, I mean, that's another thing to factor in, but it, very good question. And, you know, the answer is going to depend on the person. You know, there's nothing wrong either way. You know, for hassles, something like New Mexico skies, and there's other places that do this, but it's good because if there's a problem, you make a phone call. You know, in my case, you know, I can maybe make a phone call or I can make a phone call, but if Tom, the guy that built the thing, is, is out of town for two weeks, then, you know, I'm out of luck for two weeks. So, but no, that's a very good question, though. Final, final question. Do you know the Bortle rating? I think it's a Bortle 2. In between one and two. Now, this was as of, oh, when was the last time they came up with the, uh, the dark sky map of the US? 19, 2005 or something? I mean, it's pretty, pretty long ago. So the skies, I think, are not quite as dark as um, Nebraska. They are very dark, um, but there's a town of 300 people that's 12 miles away. And it's kind of a touristy town, so it tends to have a fair amount of lights. Now I can only see their lights. I can only see the light dome in the camera that I have outside, the one here at the bottom. It's high enough. I can't actually see it if I'm standing anywhere, but so I don't know if that actually makes a picture or makes a difference, but it, it's dark enough for me. Um, I mean, the, the skies are clear. The scene tends to be better than average. Yeah, I'm typically pulling about one and a half to two, two and a half, something like that. You know, which a lot of people are two to four. Um, so the Bortle, I mean, yeah, it would be nice to have it even darker, but um, it's it's almost as dark as you can get in the continental US. Okay, I don't see any more questions. Thank you very much, Eric. That was okay. a, a good. Uh... Very good talk. Yeah, thank you. And thank you, everybody, for uh, watching. All right, everybody have a good night.